Hello everyone, I'm Matt Lang and this is the Christian Assembly Four Square Church Podcast. I'm so glad that you can join us today as we dive deep into our fall series entitled Faith People. I've always been absolutely fascinated by the list of people compiled in Hebrews chapter 11. People that are just like you and me. People that have problems and trials and hardships. Yet we find out that each and every one of these people operate in their God-given gift called faith. So join me as we learn from their example and find out how we can become faith people. Who is excited to get into the Word of God this morning? Hey, there we go. You guys were so excited you tried to jump the gun on me. I love it. I'm excited to get in the Word of God this morning. We are in week number five. We are halfway through our fall series called Faith People, going through Hebrews chapter 11, going through the great hall of faith, talking about Old Testament saints that went before us uh, that were people that lived their lives full of faith, people that we can look to that have been modeling faith to us so we can learn to become faith people. Now, I'm excited about this week especially. We are starting uh, a a three-week mini-series within our series about a man named Abraham and his his family. I don't know if you ever heard of Abraham before. Abraham is, uh, many consider, the epitome when it comes to being a faith person. Uh, In fact, one of the nicknames attributed to Abraham is the father of faith. Uh, he, he is a man who is, is full of faith, and we have some great things uh, where we can't even unpack it in one week. We need to take the next three weeks and unpack the story of Abraham and his family. Uh, if you're in Sunday school, you know all about Abraham. Uh, here's what Sunday school kids from way back in the day know about Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm. And then you start saying, anybody remember that song? I don't know. I don't, whoever did that just may want to let kids look like idiots because by the end of that song, you're going right arm, left arm, uh, right leg, left leg, head up. Head down. I mean, you're like, you're the father Abraham. I just love it. Kids don't know the pain and struggle that we had when we were kids back in the day. Come on. So we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. Um, we're going to look at Genesis 12. We're going to see what Hebrew says about Abraham. We're going to see what uh, this part of the story in Genesis 12 says about Abraham. So it looks like at Hebrews chapter 11, starting with verse 8. It's what the author writes. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land, God promised him he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Genesis chapter 12. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had his instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and uh, headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived at Canaan, Abram traveled through uh, the land as far as Shechem. There he set up a camp beside the Oak of Morah. At that time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. And Abram built an altar there and uh, dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to him. After that, Abram traveled south and set up camp in the, the hill country with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built another altar and dedicated it to the Lord and he worshiped the Lord. Let's pray, church. God, we're so grateful. We're so thankful that we get to serve 
you, that we get to be in a place like this this morning and worship you and get into your word, Lord. We know this, that your word builds faith on the inside of us. So I pray this morning as we get into your word, Lord, will you transform us, Lord, with the power of faith. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Well, there's a, there's a, a term that we use in society today that has nothing to do with milk or bad meat, but it has everything to do with movies and has to do with uh, TV and has to do with books, a term that's called spoilers. You ever hear that term before, spoilers? What, what a spoiler is, is when you are, or before you watch a movie or read a book or watch a television show, that somebody reveals to you the, the big twist in the show or, or the end of the story and they spoil the, the story for you. Have you ever had that happen to you? Like you were going you to read a book, you're going to watch a movie, all of a sudden somebody told you about it before you got to read it or watch it or watch your TV show and it just spoiled the entire thing for you. I had that happen to me before. If you don't know this, I'm a big, I'm a big Star Wars fan. I like, I like some Star Wars. Uh, anybody else, any other Star Wars fans in the world room? Okay, just this front row could. And the people over there, the you're like, Star Wars, we're Star Trek people. How dare you? No, just kidding. But I, I'm a big Star Wars fan, and I, I, what I love about Star Wars right now in this day and age, they're not just doing movies now. They've actually made TV shows for Star Wars you can watch on, on Disney+. Plus. And my mom was nice enough to give us a subscription for Disney+, Plus for, for, for Christmas. And so uh, they have this show on there called The Mandalorian. Uh, and I love watching The Mandalorian. And, and uh, I won't get into the details of the show because you'll really think your pastor is super nerdy, but that's okay. Uh, but I watched the show. I watched the first season. I thought it was amazing. Started watching the second Second season, like each episode start to build on itself, and it was so exciting. And we were we were uh, at the week as they show one episode a week. They don't put it all on the same time like Netflix, Disney Plus. They put it once a week, and so the anticipation builds. And we were at the very last week where we're about to watch uh, the the last episode. It was that week. In fact, what they do is is they they post their episodes at midnight, and so it'll be they post their episodes on Friday at midnight. So it'll be Thursday, eleven fifty nine. All of a sudden, Friday at midnight, boom, the show pops up on the street. Streaming network, and now me uh, being a responsible person, also uh, having to watch the show with my wife. I don't watch it at midnight. We watch it that next that next evening. We go to work. We we live our lives. We're responsible. Twenty year old me would be watching it at midnight. Forty uh, five uh, year old me saying, "No, I'm gonna be responsible. I'm gonna get a good night's sleep the best I can." When you have two children, which is never happening. Um, and so uh, the, the show was going to come on that, that, that night for us. We were going to watch it that night. I was excited. I remember coming here to my job at work. I remember at lunchtime, I got on Instagram, like you guys do sometimes. Maybe you get on social media on your lunch break. And I started scrolling through Instagram, and I, I saw a post by, by Mark Hamill, who is, uh, plays the part of Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars franchise, the original trilogy. You guys remember the original trilogy way back in the 70s and 80s? And, man, I'm like, oh, it's Luke Skywalker. It's Mark Hamill. And uh, there was a picture of him. Going, going like this and kind of had his finger to his mouth going shh like that. And the captain said, did you see anything interesting on TV today? And I was like, huh? And all of a sudden, I couldn't look away quick enough, but there's a bunch of comments at the end. that says, I can't believe that Luke Skywalker came at the end of the episode and saved the day. Oh, you watch Mandalorian. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, man, it ruined. I, I was like, no, I've never been so excited and so disappointed at the same time in my entire life. It was a spoiler, and it ruined the surprise for me. I want to let you know with God, listen, with God, there are no spoilers. You say, what are you talking about, Matt? With God, there, there are no spoilers. When you're a faith person, you need to understand that, that God has things for you down the road that you, we, here's what we do as humans. We want to know every last detail. When God has something for us, we say, that's great, God. We want to know all about it. We want to know when and where and how and, and, and what and what, what's it going to look like and what shape it is and how big it is. And we want to know all about the blessings that we're going to get. And it's almost like, like God holds that back sometimes from us because he doesn't want to spoil how good it's going to be. But we get frustrated in that. We're like, no, God, we want to know now. We want to know when. We want to know how. Like, what does this look like, God? Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. You can tell I have a five-year-old boy at home. Uh, but we, we, we don't know and we'll get frustrated. But I want to let you know, not knowing all of the details that God has for us is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. It actually builds faith on the inside of us and it helps us learn to trust the Lord. 
uh, in, the, in the context of, of Abraham in this story that we just read and out of Hebrews and out of Genesis, we see this exact thing take place. And so uh, the, t- the title of the message, if you're taking notes this morning, is The Divine Go. Uh, and our, our, first, our first thought, our first point this morning in, in this message is this. Faith people move on the go. Faith people move on the go. And this is what I love about Abraham. If you take one thing away from from this amazing story of Abraham, uh, this is a good thing to take away, that he was a man that moved on the go. The go. I love what I love about Abraham is that is that he does what so many of us don't have the guts to do today. He hears the word of God and immediately he obeys. He doesn't question. He doesn't he doesn't try to find out all the facts and all the details and analyze and and, and study and ask like advice of seven other people. What do you God? I think God's telling me this, but what do you think? He hears the word from God and he says, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do what God called me to do. He was willing to move on faith uh, on one word the word go he had complete and total faith and trust in God Hebrews 11 verse 8 tells us this he went without knowing where he was going oh man I don't know about you but that'd be pretty frustrating for me I want you to go where just go where do you want me to go just go because what, what Abraham did is he, he heard the word go I want you to go Abraham, leave your father's house, leave the comforts of your home, get up, get, pick up your family, take up, pack. And, and Abraham got excited. He packed up all his stuff, grabbed, grabbed his wife, grabbed his, the servants that lived in his household, everybody that was working in his, his company uh, as a shepherd, that he, as he had a flock and, and sheep and goats. He said, okay, here's what we're all going to get up and we're just going to go. Where are we going, Abraham? It doesn't matter. We're just going to go. God told us to go. Just told us to leave this place and go. And so that's what Abraham did. I think none of us have the problem with the first part of saying, okay, God said go. That's exciting. I'm going to pack my bags. I'm going to get everything together. Where are we going to go? And, and metaphorically, what some of us do, we hear the word go, we pack our bags, and we sit in the driveway with our hands on the steering wheel with a dumb grin on our face saying, okay, God said to go. Well, I thought God said to go. Well, I'm waiting. I'm wait- what are you waiting for? I'm waiting for the directions. I'm waiting for the destination. If I know the destination, I can get my iPhone out and I can say, here's the destination. And then my map will pull out all the, where I'm going to go left, where I'm going to go right, where I'm going to go straight, and where I'm going to go on the roundabout. I'm going to take the second exit on that roundabout. And, and, and I'll know exactly where I'm going to go. That way I can get to the destination. But the thing about God is he rarely ever does that for us. He just gives us the word, Go. And we got to trust him to know that he'll get us to the right place. He heard the word, then he did what it said. God said, go, and Abraham went. Genesis 12, 1 says this. It says, the Lord had said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go. Somebody say, go. And go to the land that I will show you. That I will show show you not that I have shown you not that I'm showing you right now go to the land that I will show you Abraham didn't go on the show he went on the go and there's a difference a lot of us are waiting for the show when God's already given us the go And when we wait for the show and said, I'm not going to move until I have the show, the land that I will show you. Okay, God, well, you got to show me first. When we have that mentality, that that, that, that thought process, I want to let you know we're being disobedient to God. I want to let you know we're not operating in faith. When when we say, God, I'm just going to move on the word that you gave me. I'm going to move on the go. That's faith. Hebrews 11, 8 again says, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when he called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance, went without, or he went without knowing where he was going. So it wasn't just the fact that Abraham didn't go on the show, he didn't go on the no either. He said, I'm not not going on the no. I don't need to know where I'm going. I just need to know that God's the one who directs my paths. I just need to know that that a righteous man's paths are ordered by the Lord, that my feet are are, are moving in the direction of faith. And if my feet are moving in the direction of faith, that that's that I just got to know that God is the one who's leading me, that God is the one who's guiding me. 
Well, how, how do you know when you're going to get there? It doesn't matter. I'm just going to go on the go. I don't need the show. I don't need the no. I just need the go. Maybe that will get stuck in your head today. Some rhyming there. So in, in, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 4, we see Abraham do exactly that. He, he leaves home. It says, so Abram, now don't want you to get confused. His name was Abram down the line. God changes his name to Abraham. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. He's at Haran where he grew up. He's in his dad's house. He's, he, he's got the comforts of, of all the comforts of home. But God tells him to go, just leave Haran. And so it says that he, he got up, he, as he departed, he did exactly as God instructed. And then we go down to verse 7, and it says this, that then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. Verse 4, he's in Haram. Verse 7, he's in this place called Shechem. Haram and Shechem, get this, are 400 miles away from each other. For 400 miles, Abraham was just obeying the word go. For 400 miles, Abraham had him, his wife, all of his flocks, the, the hired hands that he had to help him with his flocks, all of his earthly possessions, just going. I, I, are you going the right way, Abraham? I don't know. I must be because God just told me to go. Didn't tell. Did God never point at him, the Bible says, in a direction? God never said, here's a compass. You know, here's north, south, east, west. I want you to go southeast. I'm going to five clicks that way. He never said anything like that. He just said, go. Leave the land to a place that I will show you. And Abraham had enough faith just to get up and to go and take everybody and everything with them. And he went for 400 miles in faith just knowing that i'm going to get to the spot where god's going to get me and when finally 400 miles later after leaving Haran, he gets to this place called shechem and god stops him and says abraham this is it this is the land that i'm going to give to your descendants faith is a hard thing sometimes can you imagine going 400 miles in this like i've been i've just drove around here in town before and just like wonder for a second, like for maybe going like a quarter mile or maybe just a couple blocks. Like, am I going the right way? Abraham went for 400 miles with no map. No, no Siri telling him, turn here. Nothing. Just the unction of, of the Spirit of God telling him to go. And him having faith to believe that God was just taking him to the right place. 400 miles later, God stops him and says, this is it. I, I remember when, when Gwyneth and I we're praying about where God was going to send us as lead pastors. We, we had a job. Each of us worked at a, a fairly large church in, in uh, this town called Camas, Washington, just right across the river from Portland, Oregon. Uh, I was a youth pastor there. She was a communications pastor there. And we were there for almost a decade. We had a condo that we bought. Uh, we, we, we just had a kid, Asher. Uh, we, we, were, we were living life. Things were, were pretty comfortable for us. But we felt the unction of the Holy Spirit that we were supposed to go. I, I loved young people. I still love young people. It, sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, God, I, like, being a youth pastor was so much easier. It was a lot more fun. There was a lot more pizza involved. There was a lot more like, come on, God, like this, this is fantastic. But... But, but God called us to be lead pastors, and so we, we talked to our, our, our lead pastor about it, and he, he agreed, like, yeah, this is, this is the voice of God. This is God's call for your life. And so we agreed on a date where I'd stop being the youth pastor. And uh, so I, I preached all the way till August, and it made sense the people that we raised up would take over the beginning of the school year. We got to the end of August, and there was still no place for us to go. Places that we thought were going to be the church that maybe uh, that God would open up a door for us to go. The door didn't open. Uh, there are places, the other places that wanted us. There's one place that said, hey, come, uh, be with us, uh, mentor some of our leaders, and then we're going to send you out in a couple years to go plant a church. Uh, we, felt, we felt like God said, no, that's not for you. There's another church that said, hey, this pastor's going to transition in a couple years. Uh, uh, come be his associate pastor and then take over the church. Felt like that wasn't for us. There's one church actually that just everything seemed to make sense in my brain. It was in the town that I grew up in in Puyallup, Washington, uh, two hours north from where we were. My family still lived there in town. Uh, it, was, it was a church that, that we interviewed with, went through the entire process with, said, hey, we want you to come be our pastors. Will you pastor this church? And everything in my brain said, this makes sense, but faith in my heart said, no, this isn't it. And we said no, still not knowing where we were going to go. 
And I remember we got a, we got a call uh, about this church in, in Missoula, Montana. I wasn't even looking at Missoula. I, wouldn't, I'd, I had our district supervisor ask me if I wanted to go uh, to eastern Washington. And I told him, no, I said, I, I want to stay on the west side of the mountains in Washington. He says, you don't want to go east of the mountains at all? I'm like, absolutely not. We're way east of those mountains right now, everybody. But we, 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 we got this call. Uh, we, we talked to, to, to Pastor Mike, who is here. We talked to our district supervisor uh, and, and, and began to process. And we agreed, said, let's just come check it out. Let's come visit. And I came to check it out. And uh, I had every thought in my head, says, you're going to come and you're going to hear the voice of God. You're going to hear a yes or you're going to hear a no. It's going to be one of those two things. It's going to be clear. It's going to be obvious. And I got here and I stood right here on a, on a Sunday morning back when it was still raining in the building before the roof got fixed. Who remembers that? I remember standing right here in November just before Thanksgiving. And uh, I remember the, the Grizzlies, God help them, they just lost to the Bobcats. Everybody was in a bad mood. And I remember standing right here uh, preaching uh, and waiting to hear from God, saying, okay, and I didn't hear anything. We went and drove all over the city and walked all over the city and walked through the mall and, 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 and waiting to hear from God. Didn't hear a yes, didn't hear a no. I said, here's what we're going to do, Gwyneth. We're going to climb to that M up there on that big hill. We're going we're gonna to do that. And I took my one-and-a-half-year-old son and strapped him to my back. And uh, us sea-level people who was living in the Portland area came to this higher elevation. I got two uh, switchbacks in, and I was, <laughs> and lost my breath. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I, I still, I said, if I just get to the top of this M, I know it overlooks the city. I'll see the city, and God will tell me yes or he'll tell me no. And I got up there, and you know what I heard? I just heard myself breathing. I didn't hear anything from God. I didn't feel anything from God one way or the other. We got back on the plane. We flew home. We were a little bit frustrated. Like, we came all this way. We don't even know. Like, we don't know. Is this the place or not the place? And the more we process, the more we talk about it, there were things on our, our checklist we were looking for in a church. And, and these things were checking. Some of the, this church was checking a lot of those boxes. And we started to talk and we said, you know, we feel like, like maybe the Holy Spirit's drawing us to this place. We weren't even looking for it, but he's drawing us here. But we're just not 100% sure. I love it when people say that. I'm just not 100% sure. I, want, I need to know that I know that I know that I know that I know before I follow what I feel like God's telling me to do. And, and we, we kept talking about it. We're just not 100% sure. I even started making up numbers. Like, like well, I'm like, like 75% sure. And when it's like, well, I'm only like 60% sure. How do you quantify something like that? But we just know we weren't all the way sure. And then all of a sudden we started to talk. We was like, wait a minute. If we were 100% sure, we have just eliminated faith from the equation. If we feel like God's made, drawing us to this place, let's just say yes. Let's not worry about the details. Let's just say yes and see what God does. And so we said yes. Talk to Pastor Mike here. Talk to the, the district supervisor. Said yes. And so we made start making preparations to, to leave. Put our, our, our condo on, on, on the market. Started packing boxes. And I remember right in that season, uh, I got invited to go down to Beaverton, Oregon. One of my best friends in the world was pastoring a church down there. Said, hey, I want you to come. Uh, would you come speak on a Sunday morning? I said, absolutely. Absolutely, I'd love to. Came and, and spoke both of their services. Uh, went and had lunch with him afterwards. Jumped back in my car. And, and you have to go north on I-5 to, to get back to where I lived in Camas. And so I'm driving north on I-5. It's raining that day. Funny thing about the Northwest, it rains all the time, but when it rains, people don't know how to drive in the rain. It is absolutely crazy. So I'm on I-5 on a Sunday, and it's bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. We aren't moving at all. And I'm getting frustrated because there's this gigantic white RV right in front of my car. I'm stuck behind this RV for 45 minutes. I can't see any of the signs uh, from the freeway to, to tell what exit I'm on or, or how far I'm away from my exit. And I'm starting to get a little frustrated. And for 45 minutes, I'm, I'm kind of grumbling, complaining, you know, and, and what in the world's going on? Why is this RV in front? Why can't I see? Come on, this is so stupid. And then I, I felt the, heard the familiar voice of the Holy Spirit just simply tell me, look up. And so I, I just, I, I thought it was a spiritual thing because we get really spiritual sometimes and so I just said yes Lord I need to look up to you and I you know I just started to, to, to pray and sing some worship songs and God's like no 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 that's great look up and I'm like what yes I lift up my eyes to the hills Lord where do my help come from he's like no 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 I just felt, kept hearing the words of God in my heart look up and finally I said I'm like maybe he's talking about physically with my eyes and so I look up 
And in front of me, for the last 45 minutes, this, this gigantic RV was in front of me, and it had these big, bold, red letters that had been in front of me for 45 minutes that I looked up and I saw it, and it just said one word, Montana. And I chuckled. I laughed. I said, God. I said, I don't need a sign. I already said yes. We already said that we'd go to Montana. I'm not looking for a sign and, and I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, yeah, but when you are a person of faith, when you operate in faith, when you go on the go before the show or the no, I'm going to confirm my word in you. I'm going to confirm that you're doing the right thing. And this is exactly what God did for Abraham. He got all the way to Shechem 400 miles later, and God showed him. The God who knows suddenly was the God who shows and said, here it is. This is the land that I'm giving to you and your descendants. I want to ask you the question today. What's your go? What is it? I, I, I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea. This message is not to encourage you to go home and pack up your bags and leave this church and, and leave Missoula and move somewhere else. But, but this was Abraham's go, but what's your go? Your go could, could look like, like, like something else. Your, low, your go could look like something different, but it's you stepping out in faith. Maybe, maybe your, your go is just simply uh, this. God's calling you to leave your job and, 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 and go to another job, uh, and you're really nervous about it. It's like, I don't know if I can do that go. Maybe what, what's, that God, what's, that, what's that job I'm supposed to have, God? Who knows? Maybe God's actually saying, hey, I want you to go and quit your job and start your own business. Maybe God's just looking and saying, hey, all the friends that you have right now, none of them are encouragers. In fact, a lot of them drag you down and, 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 and put you back to, to a spot where I haven't called you to be. And you're doing things I haven't called you to do. And you're wasting your time. And, and, and you're, 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 you're going down a wrong path. Maybe you're somebody going down the path of addiction or, or, or the path of just gossip and negative thinking uh, because of friends that you have. And God's saying, no, I, I need you to go and leave them and you're so afraid saying God if I leave them I don't have anyone else I don't have any other friends I don't have any other community but but I want to let you know when you go you can trust God that he'll take you to the right place with the right people and build the right community uh Come on, I believe that's the type of God that we serve. Maybe, maybe, maybe God's calling you to go out of the comfort that you live in right now and calling you to be a foster parent or maybe to, to adopt a, a, a child. Uh, what, whatever it is that you're going through, I believe that we all at some point in our life have a divine go, and I want to encourage you, when you have that divine go, simply do this, go. God, will, God knows the details God has it all figured out. Whatever your divine go is, you just need to go. Don't hesitate. Be obedient. Every second you wait is, is what I call delayed obedience. And delayed obedience is this. It's disobedience. Uh, if God called you to do it, stop trying to map it out. Stop trying to, to analyze it. Try, stop trying to figure out the end result. If God called you to do it, I believe he's going to put you in the right place with the right people at the right time with the right provision and give you everything that you need to get to where you need to go this is the type of God we serve a God who tells us to go my second my, my last thought is this this morning faith people they see the real promise faith people see the real promise Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 9 tells us this and even when he reached the land God promised him he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac, who was his son, and Jacob, who was his grandson, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a, a city designed and built by God. Abraham spent, listen, he spent his, the entirety of the rest of his life in Canaan. Except for a short period, we had to go down to Egypt because there's a famine, and then he came back again to Canaan. And the entire time he lived there, listen, he didn't own any property except for a little plot of land that he bought after his, his wife passed away to bury her. God promised, hey, I'm going to give this land to your descendants Abraham and the entire time Abraham was alive he didn't own any of that land but he still lived there 
It wasn't his land. The Canaanites inhabited that land. They had buildings. They had cities. They had houses. Abraham didn't have any of that. He just had tents. And he says, I'm just going to, I'm going to, this is God, this is the, the land that God promised me. And so I'm going to live here. And so he, he, he went from place to place. He was kind of like a nomad and traveled in his tents and brought his flocks to green pastures and to water and, and, and lived that way as a nomad, as a stranger in the land, as a foreigner in the land, but knew that this was the land that God called him to. And so the Bible says in Hebrew, by faith, he lived there. You know what? I believe that God has wired us the same way. By faith, we live in God's promises even when we don't have them, even when we don't see the end result, even when we say, there's no way I don't understand how if this belongs to everybody else but it doesn't belong to me, if God has promised this to me but I don't see how he's going to do it, still by faith, God calls us to live in that promise. And how, how did Abraham do that, though? The rest of his life, he was promised this land. He was even promised descendants. Hey, Abraham, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless the entire world through your descendants. This land is going to belong to your descendants. If that land belongs to his descendants, something has to happen. He has to have descendants. And at this point, he's 75 years old, living in a land that isn't him, that's promised him to his descendants, and he doesn't have a son. And for 25 years, from 25 to 100 years old, he walks in this promise and lives in this promise, but still doesn't have a son. And we're going to talk about that more next week. But the exciting thing to me is that Abraham kept his eyes on the promise. The real promise. How did he do that without moping? How did he do that without grumbling? How did he do that without complaining? Because he recognized what the real reward from God was. He recognized what the real promise was. Yeah, God promised him land and God promised him children. And both those things are amazing. Both those things are good. Both those things God used to actually bless the entire world. But Abraham said, I know there's something even greater than this promise of earthly wealth that God wants to give me. I know there's a promise that is ahead of me. There is a there is a city whose maker and and builder is God. There is a city that man did not build here on earth, but a city that's not even here on earth, a city that I can look to, that I know one day, even past this, after I live and have children and, and live and they have this land, and I'm living by faith, I know that I live by faith, not to, to possess things here on earth, but I live here by faith, knowing that one day I'm going to go to that city and I get to be with God. Mom, that's a promise to Abraham, that's a promise to you, and it's a promise to me. And while we're here, we live like Abraham. I want to let you know, listen, he was a stranger, he was a foreigner, he was an alien where he lived. That land was not his. I want to let you know we're the same way. We live here on earth, but this isn't our home. This isn't where, we're here temporarily. We're here on vacation. We're just passing through, but there's a greater promise. There's a city whose maker and builder, whose architect is God that one day we get to go to. And while we're here sometimes grumbling about the go and grumbling about the promise that we haven't seen fulfilled yet and and grumbling about what we don't know and God hasn't shown and and when are we going to, we're impatient, we want it now. What is it going to look like? Why we are grumbling, God's saying, hey, look up. To me, set your eyes on heaven. I'm calling you to go here on earth, but I'm calling you to live by faith so you can obtain something even more precious and something worth more than land and more than wealth. Something that that is, is, is an eternity with me. I'm so glad that's the type of God that we serve. I'm going to ask the the worship team to, to come up. How did Abraham do that, though? Like, think about, first of all, just traveling 400 miles on a go. Second of all, getting the land that that God promises to give to his descendants and land that he never possesses, never owns, doesn't even even have children until, let me give you a spoiler, you'll hear it next week, until he's 100 years old, he has a son, one son. And God's saying, I'm going to make you a nation. How does that, how does that happen? What does that even Look like, how does Abraham keep a good attitude? How does Abraham keep an attitude of faith? How does Abraham live in faith through all of this? How does he set his eyes on heaven? What does that even look like? How does he keep his eyes on where God is? We see it in his travels. That everywhere Abraham, read it, read it in in chapter 12 again. 
when you go home. It happened two different places in chapter 12, and it happens all throughout chapter 13. Everywhere where Abraham traveled, and when he stopped, what did he do? He built an altar. He built an altar, and he worshiped God. He built an altar, and he kept his eyes on God. He built an altar and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look to you, God, who is the author and the finisher of my faith. What would it look like, church, if that was our lifestyle? Listen, if you're faith people, you need to understand this is an exercise that we need to do daily. We need to look to God. We need to worship God. We need to, we need to set our eyes on Him. In the midst of you waiting for your promise impatiently, God, when are you going to do this? God, you, you promised you'd do this for my children. You, you promised you, 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 I'd see my grandkids get saved. You, you promised that, that this would be you know, a, a blessing in my life. You promised, and, and when, and how, and where, and why. What if we stopped asking those questions and just set our minds and our eyes and our heart on God? What if, what if we, in the midst of confusion and chaos, just trusted God that no way I know God has my best interests at heart I know that God has plans to prosper me and not to harm me give me a hope in a future I know that God is going to take me exactly to where I need to go with the right people the right place the right time the right provision what if instead of me waiting impatiently I waited like this and I lifted my hands and I lifted my voice and I lifted my heart, and even in the midst of me not knowing exactly where God is sending me and exactly what God is doing, me just recognize that God's doing something and I need to worship Him for it. I just need to sense that God's doing something in my family. I don't see it yet, and I don't know how it's going to transpire, but I'm still going to worship Him. I know I've been praying for God for years to heal me, and He hasn't healed me yet, and I don't know what that's going to look like, and I don't know if it's healing here or on the other side of eternity, but while I'm waiting, I'm going to lift my hand and I'm going to worship him I'm going to set my eyes on him come on what would happen church if we just simply did this and said we're going to worship you God in spirit and in truth let's do this church can we just stand up together I believe that we are a church that are full of faith people and faith people worship God that faith people are worshipers some of you right now are waiting some of you got the divine go years ago and you've been going, going, going and you're wondering like, when am I going to stop? Some of you, God's promised some amazing things and you haven't seen them come to pass. Some of you, God's promised provision and promised you healing and promised restoration, promised that he would knit back relationships within your family that's been destroyed. You haven't seen it come to pass. I believe we need to be a people that worship and say, God, I'm just going to worship you even in this. I'm going to trust you even in this. I'm going to trust you that my kids and my grandkids come to know Jesus. I'm going to trust you that you're bringing provision to my family. I'm going to trust you that even if I, I forgive that person, that I know you're going to work in that situation. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. How I've proved you o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust you more. God, we want to be a church that worships you even in the, the trials, even in the uncertainties. And even just at the quietness of this moment, can you just call on his name? If you feel comfortable, can you just lift your hands right now? Jesus, we just worship you. Jesus, we know that you're good. Jesus, we know that you're in control. Jesus, we, we know that you're the one that speaks into our lives and our hearts. We know that you're the giver of life. That you're the giver of gifts. That you're the one that heals us and saves us and redeems us. You empower us. Let's worship you, Jesus.
If you were encouraged by today's message, go ahead and click the like button and leave us a comment to let us know you were listening. Also, you can hit that subscribe button right there as we upload a brand new video every single week. If you have a prayer need or want to find out more about our church, you can visit us at camissoula.org. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.